Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome to one of the highlight events of the International Space University's 28th Space Studies Program. I'm John Connolly. I'm the director of the, uh, of the Space Studies Program, and I'd like to welcome you and our inaugural Arthur C. Clarke panel. The theme of this panel is Where Space Meets Popular Culture. We have an amazing panel tonight, and you'll have a chance to ask questions following their presentation. Some quick thank yous before we begin. Tremendous thank you, of course, to Ohio University, our host here this summer. Um, we also would like to thank all of you, the local community, for coming out and supporting us the way you do. I'd also like to recognize our partners. Uh, thank you to agency partner NASA's John H. Glenn Research Center and our major sponsors, the French Space Agency, the Chinese Aerospace Corporation, the European Space Agency, the Indian Space Research Organization, Lockheed Martin Corporation, the Aerospace Corporation, the Boeing Company, and the UK Space Agency. And special thanks, of course, to the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation for making this evening possible. Finally, thank you to our panelists tonight for traveling from all points around the country to share their insights with us. I'd now like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Dr. Harry Kluwer. Uh, Harry will introduce the panelists and lead tonight's discussion. Uh, Harry is a television and film writer, director, and producer, in addition to being a scientist, inventor, and national technology policy advisor over 25 year, with over 25 years of experience in these diverse fields. In 1994, he earned the unique status of being the first and to date the only person ever to simultaneously earn two doctorate degrees, one in physics and another in chemistry from Purdue University. Makes me tired just thinking about it, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps most importantly, Harry was also a member of the founding class of the International Space University in 1988. Harry served on the founding team for ISU's sister institution, Singularity University, where he still serves as a media advisor, and he taught the first summer session at Singularity in 2009. Dr. Kluwer is founder and CEO of Laraz Incorporated and a CEO of Jupiter 9 Productions. His writing credits include Star Trek Voyager, the animated series Godzilla, and Earth's Final Conflict, um, for which he was producer and one of the creator developers. He currently has uh, in development a Fox feature, Ill Wind, that you'll see in theater sometime soon. Dr. Kluwer serves as chief uh, science advisor for the $10 million uh, Ansari X Prize, and he's one of the three founders of the Rocket Racing League. He's presently working as writer, writer and producer, adapting several best-selling science fiction books into features, including a number of novels by one of our panelists, Mike Resnick. Please help me welcome our moderator for the evening, Dr. Harry Kluwer. I wasn't planning on standing up, but since this side of the room can't see me. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as uh, John had said, we're, uh, Mike and I are ISU uh, 88ers. Um, and uh, so uh, some of you weren't even born when we went to the first class, so I feel really old now. <laughs> um, but fortunately, I have someone older here for me. So I'm going to introduce Mike Resnick. Uh, Mike is uh, one of the most uh, prolific uh, and award-winning uh, science fiction writers in the world. In fact, he, for short fiction, he has the most uh, science fiction awards of anyone uh, alive or dead. I like the or dead part. <laughs> uh, Mike has, has done numerous uh, science fiction books, um, and in fact, I am working uh, probably in five of them, uh, adapting them to uh, feature work. Um, some of my favorite are uh, Hunting the Snark, uh, Widowmaker, um, and uh, Mike has edited, I think, over 40 anthologies. Is that right? <laughs> but he's also, uh, Mike is, a, is a, uh, not only a science fiction writer, but he's an editor. He's editing Galaxy Magazine, I think I recall Galaxy's that. Galaxy's Edge. Galaxy's Edge. See, I, I screwed that up already. Um, and, uh, but he's also an expert on dog breeding. Uh, in fact, he's won several writing awards dealing with dogs. Is that correct? Yes. There we go. So uh, you will hear from Mike um, in terms of uh, his uh, personal experiences with Arthur C. Clarke. He's the uh, um, only one who has 
has had the longest relationship with him. Mike uh, Potter and I uh, had the opportunity of, of interacting with Arthur starting back in 1988. Um, next uh, to Mike Resnick is Dan St. Pierre. So Dan and I became friends when we uh, co-directed a uh, science fiction animation movie that combines science and science fiction. The movie is called Quantum Quest. And that movie has a variety of distinctions. And one of them is it's the only film to ever uh, have Neil Armstrong uh, participate in the film. Uh, it tied into the Cassini Huygens mission. Um, and uh, it merged the characters uh, are everything from photons and protons and neutrinos um, and such actors as Chris Pine and Sam Jackson. Uh, Dan has been in the animation arena working on big features going all the way back to Lion's King, Beauty and the Beast, um, where some of the other ones, Dan? Aladdin. Aladdin, et cetera, The Little et cetera. Mermaid. His last uh, feature, in fact, uh, was on 3,000 screens, um, uh, Dorothy, was it Dorothy of Oz? Legends of Oz. Legends of Oz, they changed the title. Yeah. Uh, and Dan is uh, both an art director, an artist, and a feature film director. And next to him is my good friend Mike Potter, Mike is a filmmaker, documentaries. Uh, uh, Orphans of Apollo is, is a highly award-winning documentary, and I'll let him tell you all about that. Uh, but he is also uh, runs a uh, venture firm, Paradigm Ventures, uh, and he has worked in the areas of space policy ever since I've known him back in 1988. He uh, is uh, not only a filmmaker, um, but he's also someone who has been uh, doing something, I, I think the name of it's Geek, what is it? Geeks Without Frontiers. Geeks Without Frontiers, which is very exciting. Um, I know I have no frontiers, so I should probably be involved in that. <laughs> and I'm gonna turn over this to Mike now so he can finish introducing the panel. Well, Harry, thanks very much for the introduction, and it's great that uh, we can have two of the class of 1988 ISU alumni to participate in a really important event like this. It's something that all the panelists here feel really passionate about. And we're super honored to have uh, John Beck Hoffman with us. And uh, John uh, worked at uh, JPL for many years, and now he currently still is involved uh, with JPL, but he also runs a production company called Weatherman uh, Productions, where he continues to do work for JPL, but also recently uh, released uh, a film, a, docu uh, a documentary on Discovery Channel that deals with uh, Mars rovers. So, uh, but, but probably uh, most recognized, and, and particularly in, in an audience like this, uh, and, and most known for his outstanding uh, film called uh, Seven Minutes of Terror, which really explores the uh, Mars curiosity and all the difficult challenges that the engineers and the scientists face in putting that uh, mission together. So uh, very, very excited to have John on board. One of the things that John did as part of that project was really trying to take all the ideas, uh, all the technology of JPL, and somehow combine that with the logic of Hollywood to make it uh, uh, viewable on, on, on a global scale. And the last person I'd like to introduce who's not uh, physically sit, uh, seated here at the panel, but um, is, uh, is a distinguished guest who's coming in via Skype, and that's uh, Joe Pelton. After uh, Joe's presentation, we're going to go straight to a special video that has never been uh, f uh, uh, screened uh, in public before. But let's give a quick uh, introduction to, uh, to Joe. Joe Pelton, Dr. Joe Pelton, uh, is a great friend of the International Space University. Joe was involved uh, before the class of uh, 1988. Joe was uh, uh, involved back in uh, 1987. And he's continued to be very, very involved with the Space University and helping to run the uh, Southern Hemisphere uh, of the uh, International Space University. Joe will be here um, uh, in the, in the uh, weeks ahead, and uh, so people get to meet him in person. And uh, one of the things that Joe has generously uh, donated to all the students is a book that he wrote on Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, and uh, you all get, you all have a copy of it. And when Joe is here, physically in Ohio, he'll be delighted to sign the books by uh, those who, uh, who bring the book uh, to him. So uh, Joe uh, has authored almost 40 uh, nonfiction books. 
He's a great futurist, and uh, he's also been a Pulitzer Prize-nominated writer. So it's just a real honor to be able to have this amazing panel. And Joe uh, also uh, uh, knew Arthur Clarke for many decades, and Joe's going to give us an introduction uh, in his role as uh, a board member of the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation. Uh, Joe's going to give a quick introduction to Arthur Clarke. Uh, Joe, go ahead, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Wave your hands if you can hear me. There we go. Oh, <laughs> great. Okay. Sorry I can't be with you, but uh, I want to go through a presentation that basically explains how Arthur C. Clarke played a key role in the founding of the Space University and as its first chancellor, and also to uh, talk about some of his amazing uh, uh, predictions that you'll find in the book uh, that uh, you should have all received. So uh, let's go to the presentation if we could. So uh, in the first slide, uh, just to uh, note that uh, Arthur C. Clarke was the first chancellor, and this was a process that started back in 1983 during World Communications Year when the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation was started. And uh, there was a meeting at the United Nations to celebrate the World Communications Year. And uh, at that meeting, Arthur C. Clarke agreed to the formation of the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation. And he also met with the three founders of the uh, ISU. And Todd Holly was currently working for me at Intelsat at the time, where he really got the idea for the ISU. Uh, at the UN, the speakers uh, there were Arthur, uh, the officials from the International Telecommunications Union, and my boss, uh, Santiago Estrain, the Director General of Intelsat. And I was there because, uh, I, first of all, I wrote Dr. Estrain's speech, and also as Managing Director of the International Communications US, which was a presidential appointment, I wanted to confer with uh, Arthur Clark about what he wanted the new Clark Foundation to achieve. Uh, we had a reception at the White House in 1983 where we formed the foundation and was formally announced. And uh, also during that uh, uh, award-winning uh, process, uh, Buckminster Fuller gave his last major talk uh, on this occasion and unfortunately died a week later. Uh, and just quickly, just some of Arthur C. Clarke's amazing predictions. Uh, he predicted the communication satellite in uh, October of 1945. And in July of 63, we had CENCOM 2 uh, realizing that prediction. Uh, then uh, in 1956, uh, he wrote uh, a letter uh, predicting the idea of wristwatch uh, navigation uh, receivers from navigation satellites. And that was uh, achieved by GPS in 1978. Uh, in uh, HAL in 2001, the Space Odyssey, he predicted uh, intelligent computers that could beat uh, grandmasters at chess. And of course, that was achieved in 1996 when Deep uh, Blue uh, beat Kasparov. He also predicted uh, worldwide mobile uh, wireless satellite communications, again with uh, handheld devices. And uh, that's been achieved with increasing uh, abilities since 1980. Uh, but there are whole host of predictions. Uh, Arthur Clarke is uh, in many ways the father of internet, uh, Google, uh, ComSats, uh, GPS, uh, navigation satellites, weather satellites, uh, online banking and shopping uh, by home computer, computer notepads, email, e-banking, e-commerce, all types of entertainment, video systems and media, uh, new types of uh, power systems, uh, teleeducation, telehealth, bioengineering, DNA testing, uh, telecommuting, telework, and telecities, automated and driverless cars, uh, project safeguard to uh, uh, defend our planet. And when I'm there, I'm going to show a new video we've just done on cosmic hazards, uh, the dangers of uh, climate change, and uh, the need for clean energy to replace our dependence on fossil fuels and a whole host of space propulsion and transportation systems. 
But the thing is, uh, uh, as you will see, uh, if when you have uh, during your spare time at insufficient sleep university, uh, that there are uh, many predictions that have been achieved uh, typically about 30 years before uh, he, uh, he envisioned them. Uh, but uh, you will also find that there are a whole host of predictions yet to come. So I'm sorry not to be with you this evening, but I hope to see you soon. And uh, it sounds like a great panel, and uh, I'll be listening. Uh, Joe, we're, we're grateful for uh, the contribution, and it's really great to have that bridge between your personal friend, Arthur Clark, and uh, the panel tonight. We're going to go directly to uh, a film that's never been shown in, in public before. <coughs> And right after the film's over, we're going to kick off the panel discussion with Mike Resnick, who also is a personal friend of Arthur Clark. Get the light. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. Well, space is there. And we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there. And new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure of which man has ever embarked.
that wouldn't be very cost effective. So I'll just say, hi, gang. I gather your theme is, how has science fiction affected my life? Well, it didn't affect my life. It created it. I imagine that's true of most of you. By lucky coincidence, this gives me a chance for a commercial. I've just written a whole book, Astounding Days, a science fiction autobiography, which goes into all this in nostalgic detail. Incidentally, Isaac, thanks very much for the nice review in the Sunday Times. I've also had a charming letter from Bob Block, clamoring for more. Uh, whether I ever get around to amazing years and time of wonder, only the gods know. At great expense, I've sent copies of the UK edition to a few friends, and the rest of you will just have to wait for Bantam to do its thing. Finally, although my well-known modesty makes it painful for me even to mention the matter, I'd like to clarify a point that's caused a certain amount of confusion in the colonies. And even though Her Majesty has made me a commander of the Order of the British Empire, I'm still a mister, not a sir. Also, on entering my presence, it's unnecessary to go down on hands and knees. A low bow from the waist is quite sufficient. Goodbye from Arthur Clarke, and my love to you all. I just have a few words to say to finish this session. First, you heard what Arthur Clarke said, that he thanked me for the review I wrote for the London Times, and I suppose you'd like to know what his last letter to me contained. Evil in return for good, that's what it contained. You know, there was an airplane crash in Iowa a month or so ago, or maybe it was more, time vanishes for me in which a hundred-something people survived. Others, unfortunately, died. One of the survivors was reading an Arthur Clarke novel while the plane was trying desperately to land. And this was reported in the newspaper. And Arthur Clarke, as is his wont, made up about 750 copies and sent them to 750 friends, acquaintances, and strangers. He sent one to me, and underneath he wrote, he should have been reading one of your books, and he would have slept through the whole thing. <laughs> and I wrote back, dear author, the reason he read one of your books was that in case he did crash, death would come as a blessed release. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to start this by turning it over to, to Mike, who uh, he was the one who brought us that last video. And, and just for the record, the other two videos were playing extremely uh, out of sync and slow. It, it would normally, that science fiction piece I put together would have played like in, in real time. So uh, you're going to have to get you a better laptop. Uh, <laughs> so we'll turn it over to Mike. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I, I can't tell if this thing's up. You can't find. Uh, that particular tape or segment of a tape uh, came uh, at the 1989 World Convention where we had a 50th anniversary banquet, the 50th anniversary of Worldcon. They had a number of speakers in me, Fred Pohl, Jack Williamson, and all, but the highlight and the, and the one everybody asks to see again and again is what you just saw. Arthur has done many, many important things in his life, serious things. It's not generally known that he had a wonderful sense of humor. Uh, I think it's still in print. If not, you can certainly find it in any secondhand store. He did a collection uh, called Tales from the White Heart. The White Hart was a pub in England that most of the writers of his generation, uh, Brian Aldous, Eric Frank Russell, Clark, a number of others, gathered at and drank and told tall stories. And the kind of stuff that went into Tales of the White Hart were, for example, 
a story about a cowardly man-eating plant. And, and Arthur could do these things. He did a ton of them when he was a young man, and he tended to sign them, especially in fanzines, but also in some of the prozines, as Ego, E-G-O, Clark. Now, move the clock to 1988, and I'm the Toastmaster of the Worldcon in New Orleans, and they ask me, in exchange for you know, my presidential suite or whatever the hell they gave me, would I edit an, an anthology for them, any subject I wanted? So I said, sure, I would do one of parodies uh, in science fiction fandom, BEM, B-E-M, is an acronym for Bug-Eyed Monsters. So I decided to do one called Shaggy BEM Stories. And I found parodies by Asimov, by Poole Anderson and all, but almost the funniest of them was by Arthur Clarke. In the 1930s, H.P. Lovecraft wrote a story called At the Mountains of Madness. And Clark, as Ego Clark for some fanzine, wrote At the Mountains of Murkiness. So I sent him a contract, he signed it, sent it back, and I told the treasurer for the Worldcon, make us check out the Ego Clark, just to show him we remember. And about two weeks later, I get a letter from Arthur saying, I'm really a modest man, but I don't think it's unfair to say that everybody in my bank knows who I am. But it took me seven hours to get them to take the goddamn check. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was 1988. 1990, uh, I had a book out of it. It came out here in 88, but 90 was in England. And it was called Ivory, uh, a... Um, a legend of past and, and future. And Arthur wrote me a fan letter saying how much he liked it. And I'd never gotten a, a letter like that from Arthur, so I wrote him back and thanked him. And he said uh, he wouldn't be a bit surprised if it won the Arthur Clark Award. And I said, I never even heard of the Arthur Clark Award. What is it, Arthur? He says, brand new award, 1,000 pounds goes with it. And I said, well, I hope I win too. Uh, thank you for telling me. And he said, and if you win, you used to write in the adult field when you were learning how, and you, you never told anybody what your names were, the names you used. So if you win, your 1,000-pound check is going to be made out to anonymous resident. <laughs> <laughs> well, I cheated. I lost. <laughs> anyway, Arthur, uh, his main claim to fame, of course, is a science fiction writer, but his first major breakthrough was in 1952 with a book called The Exploration of Space, which was nonfiction, but it was a Book of the Month Club selection. And back then, that, that made you. And his second major breakthrough uh, the, that made him an international superstar, again, wasn't a book. It was uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was based on a, a short story of his. And uh, he, he was always very, very accessible to newcomers and to beginners. And as I say, he had a sense of humor that because of his accomplishments, most people either overlooked or didn't even know about. But he was a funny, funny man. You're at bat. <laughs> so um, thanks, Mike, for those, those stories. Mike uh, has uh, uh, written, I guess, over 200, actually, um, risque books in his early career. So. Uh, and none of you will ever find out any <laughs> of the names <laughs> I use. Anonymous. I think it was anonymous friends, Mike. Exactly. <laughs> and, and he'll autograph anyone who brought him tonight. He'll autograph them later. Exactly. <laughs> no, it's, it's not commonly known, but but an awful lot of us got our start there because uh, it was a way to make a living while you were learning how to write. Uh, Robert Silverberg did about 300 of them over in the field next door. Mysteries. Uh, Donnelly e. Westlake, Lawrence Block each did a couple of hundred. And as I say, it, it was the only way you could you know, make money learning how to write. So we did. And then we all got out as quick as we could and never told anybody what <laughs> names we used. <laughs> so know, as long as they spelled it right on the check and never appeared anywhere else, that was what we wanted. And this was before Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> exactly. Oh, but well I, before. <laughs> I, I, I think there might be a, a lawsuit coming with Fifty Shades now. I think. I, thi I think we're mostly out of it by, oh, the mid-60s. So the, uh, um, the video that uh, started this was, was, was from Mike. And the next one was something I had put together for Singularity University. I thought it was good for this panel 
because it shows the difference between you know, the way space really is and the way that Hollywood sort of uh, uh, glorifies and enhances um, <coughs> not only space but everything from robotics to particle beam weapons to genetics. Um, in Hollywood, we uh, drive things um, through drama, through fiction, um, and sometimes we get science uh, right, um, but more often we will make a movie like Interstellar, uh, <laughs> which my, my latest peeve is Interstellar, uh, and uh, I wish, wish Arthur was around so uh, he and I can both rag on it because it, uh, for me that's one of the, uh, I think it's that movie and then The Hobbit in terms of fantasy movies. Uh, I would never call uh, Interstellar science fiction. And the reason I say that is, is I think as a filmmaker, what we have the option to do, we can tell those stories and use real science fiction and real science in our science fiction. Um, or we can do what Interstellar did, which is they wanted to have a, an instance of where time moves slower, and they decided to take that element and forget the fact that a black hole has high gravity and a planet would be crushed into a marble. Um, there are countless instances of where science is not properly portrayed uh, in, in films. And part of the question is, is how important is that? I think sometimes it's very important, and other times if it's, it's really a purpose or a point you're trying to communicate. One of the points that science fiction has communicated in Hollywood, I think, is a great fear of artificial intelligence. Pretty much every movie that you saw in there was how how awful uh, AI is going to be. Um, my AI overlord masters have told me to inform you that they will be quite gentle in wooing you. <laughs> so with that, Dan and I had worked on a movie, Quantum Quest, and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to him a little bit. Dan's been in the animation world forever. The direct connection to Arthur and that is our movie uh, takes us out to Saturn where the computer in the Cassini spaceship is Gal, and uh, we in fact have a homage in to 2001 in that film. So Dan, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience with science and science fiction? And well, sure. Uh, you know, <laughs> I have to say I'm probably the least qualified to be talking about science, and I mean I love science fiction and I love you know uh, all of the possibilities and in, in, in the work that's been done and the work that's yet to come, and um, you know. The, the potential for creating more entertainment for you know everybody's consumption. Um, my idea of science, you know, growing up and being a cartoonist and an animator is, um, well, for example, a, a guy's walking down the sidewalk and an anvil falls on his head, and he gets smashed into a pancake, and then the pancake walks around and blinks at you, you know, and so so that well that's physics, right? I mean, the anvil comes down and you know. So, you know, my world is about <laughs> stretching the truth like that. And uh, uh, here, here's another example. Um, I was working on a series called E-Man and the Masters of the Universe, which I don't know if anybody knows that, but um, uh, that, that show. But, um, you know, like there's an asteroid hurtling towards Eternia. He-Man gets on a rocket. He's standing on the nose of the rocket, and it goes up and the rocket hovers next to the asteroid and it reaches up and pushes it away and, and, and saves Eternia from, from the asteroid. So, you know, it's like, okay, you, you guys, science people, tell me, can, can He-Man really do that? Like, <laughs> is that He-Man can do anything, come on, <laughs> we all know that. So, so in the case of Quantum Quest, what we, um, what we needed to do was I inform and educate and inspire and with that film, it was taking scientific principles and concepts. And I have to thank Harry for dragging me into it because now I know what a neutrino is and I know what um, a photon is and does and uh, you know, particles of light and all of that. You know, of course, we had to do something that would make it engaging and fun to watch. And so we gave um, the, uh, the voice, the core of the sun is William Shatner. And <laughs> so We've got William Shatner's voice, and uh, we, um, we, we had to g give it some eye appeal and make it, again, so it's relatable. And, and so, so our, our photon is a, 
was kind of a kind of a supermodel kind of a guy, and he hangs around with the neutrinos. It's kind of a hot supermodel kind of a gal, and and you know, so it's like this is a Hollywood sort of star appeal, and we gave them great voices, and um, but I think the the message became clear because it was fun to watch the story and track along with it, but it was also you're getting you're getting information, you're getting education. If you didn't know the stuff, you're getting education in the process, and it, it makes it painless and and certainly less academic to, to do it that way. So um, that was that was the challenge, and that was uh, that's what we tried to achieve was so something that was fun and educational. The other aspect of it, of course, was the uh, Cassini Huygens aspect of it, which is quite literal. Um, we tried to give it a little personality, but you, you can't stretch too far. And so we found our boundaries with that, and uh, it also had to feel like it was the same movie. So again, the challenge to, to blend it together was, was there for us. Now, uh, I, uh, Chris, are you in, Chris Scott, are you in the audience somewhere? Yes, I could. Oh, there you are. So uh, Chris actually gave me a story that I, uh, in my infinite ignorance, had not heard before, which was um, how Disney helped drive our original space program. And so um, I'm not sure if Dan knows this story, but it's interesting because Dan's worked on a lot of Disney films. And Chris was telling me this morning how uh, he went around uh, with, uh, and in part, little films uh, using Disney characters, showing you know uh, how how uh, space flight could happen, and uh, to drive from senator to senator and congressman to congressman to get people excited about space. Um, and so the film that we did really followed in a tradition that I uh, was um, unaware of until this morning, which was using animation to advance uh, space and space exploration. In our film, uh, by the way, you actually do get to see the spider craters of Mercury and the surface of Venus using radar data. The one thing that we did differently than any other film that I've worked on in that uses science fiction is we could have taken one one thousandth the amount of time and made up craters and mountains, but instead we use the actual photographic and radar data for everything that you see in the film when it's a space object is the actual surface of a moon, the actual surface of a planet. Um, and that film actually ends with a three and a half minute uh, flyover of Titan based upon a, a mix of photographic and radar data. So, but uh, going more realism is, is um, uh, Orphans of Apollo, and so I'll turn this to, to Mike. Yeah, so uh, the first thing, I don't know how many people heard the radio interview that John Connolly did uh, with uh, the radio station the other day, and uh, the radio reporter was really excited when uh, they, they uh, read that part of this panel dealt with STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics, and that's really one of Dan's, that's his sweet spot, is, is combining the engineering uh, art, you know, the, the art uh, element of it. But uh, the first uh, film that, part of the film that we saw uh, just a few minutes ago was this, uh, this idea, Audacity to Dream, which is kind of a, com a companion piece in some ways to Orphans of Apollo. Orphans of Apollo, uh, the documentary film I did on um, the efforts to commercialize the, uh, the Mir space station, which really has to be seen as one of the most important, it's really ground zero of the space commercialization effort, but that project would not have happened without the International Space University. Those key players, many of those key players uh, started their uh, space uh, professional careers uh, here at the International Space University. And uh, if you look at Audacity to Dream, it's really the optimistic part of that. You know, I, I think a lot of people who felt like they were orphaned after uh, after uh, man, humanity had landed on the moon and all the politicians had promised us that we'd be living on the moon and we'd have manufacturing facilities on the moon. And then when they shut the Apollo program down and uh, the government surrendered, people felt uh, really bitter about, uh, you know, because we had all believed, we had accepted what the government said. And so really it's uh, people like the International Space University, the new space revolution where we said, okay, if the government can't really do the whole job, then we have to do the job. Uh, it's a huge problem, but we can be part of that solution. And commercial uh, entrepreneurial and commercial energy can help uh, solve that problem. I think that uh, one of the things about uh, uh, Arthur Clarke is that uh, he had uh, an amazing vision 
And as the vice, uh, as the founding uh, chancellor of the International Space University, I sat in the audience like many of you, and uh, he he came in with a uh, with a satellite uh, address to the inaugural class of the International Space University in 1988. But one of the things that uh, Clark um, did, which uh, Joe touched on, but didn't go into detail about, when he imagined geosynchronous satellites, he came up with this idea and he said, look, if we park these satellites in this position, we can solve so many of the world problems in uh, telecommunications. And he later wrote an article that said, how I lost a billion dollars by not patenting the geosynchronous satellite concept. And you know, uh, one of the things about International Space University, as we tackle these big problems, most likely in the future, some of these, uh, these problems are gonna be solved through open source technology. And if you look at the first chancellor of the International Space University, he's one of the most amazing open source technology people that have ever existed in all of humanity. And he just did that kind of in his, uh, his spare time. So I think that uh, when I left the International Space University, within one year, uh, I, I had put together uh, an organization called the Global Telecommunications Society. And so when we wanted to kick off our inaugural meeting, we wanted to do a video very much like the videos that we showed uh, here. So I sent a fax to uh, Colombo, Sri Lanka, and I asked Arthur Clark, I said, would you be willing to give us a short video about your vision of uh, global telecommunications? And uh, we got uh, a fax back a few days later saying, hey, it's your good luck. A BBC uh, television crew has been at my house and they've been doing interviews and they've uh, kindly done this, uh, they videotaped this, uh, this interview. And I have to tell you that uh, the, uh, you know, a week or two later, the, the video arrived in Washington, D.C. and we watched it and it was a fantastic uh, video and uh, Arthur hit uh, you know, all the beats, he hit everything uh, perfectly. But I have to tell you the thing that uh, when I think about Arthur Clark, First of all, it's, it's his uh, elegant and uh, distinguished voice, the clarity of his vision, which is really beyond uh, comparison. But the thing I will always remember were the tropical birds in the background because the BBC reporters had shot the video in the backyard in Sri Lanka. And it was, it's, it's, just, it's just such a powerful image today. So really, I think uh, Audacity to Dream is really about reclaiming what many of us believe so passionately about, which is our destiny uh, in planetary expo exploration, our destiny in the, in the stars. So John, of course, is, has done a, uh, a film, uh, Seven Minutes of Terror, that uh, a raise of hands, I, I would think that most of you have seen this. So I actually had the uh, privilege, uh, uh, Peter took me to, to the uh, actual landing at JPL, so I actually saw those looks of terror. Um, and uh, so I, I, I really enjoyed your work because from the perspective of the people around me and the amount of alcohol some of them were drinking, <laughs> uh, <laughs> kind of fed into it. I, I, I however, uh, I guess I, was, I wasn't terrified. I, I pretty much thought from the work that we had done that this was a, just a brilliant idea of, of how to do the landing. But why don't you tell the audience about, about how this film came about and and uh, what really drove you um, to it? Thanks. Well, first, I just want to say it is really, like for me, it is a big honor to be here because um, as you were talking about STEM, and now you want to call it STEAM, um, I was like that little A begging to be part of something important. <laughs> and now I feel like I'm an actual capital A <laughs> in this <laughs> process. And uh, I worked. Um, I started working for JPL back in 91 on, on Mars Observer mission, and I was just a clerk, and I was a musician. I wasn't, I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I wasn't a filmmaker yet. Um, and someone was walking through the office with their camera gear, and uh, I said, hey, what, 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 what are you making? And he said, we're making a video. And I'm like, I was doing your music. And he's like, oh gosh. Uh, nobody, kid, you wanna send me your demo? And so I did, and he really liked it. So. It, that got used for their mission, and even though Mars Observer blew up, um, my music got used, and I got a job in the TV studio there at JPL because of that. So um, back in the early 90s, NASA just wasn't really doing these type of emotional films. In fact, they kind of like were really against it. Um, NASA had done documentaries in, in the past um, about the moon landings, and um, but it just kind of started to feel like uh, manipulative. So 
NASA had kind of a strict policy about we're just going to do the facts only, just the raw data, and then the media can take that and do whatever they want with it. So when I started working for JPL in the media department, everything was very, very dry. There was no story, and if there was, a, there was no story. It was just facts only. Um, so it was during, the, um, and I'm getting to seven minutes of terror, but like long version. But um, I did a video. I, I was shooting for the Mars Pathfinder landing. It was July 4th, 1997. And I was in the control room, and I was lucky enough to be on camera shooting in the control room with everybody. It was a very cramped, crowded room, and just the tears and the excitement and the fear. And I'm like, oh, 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 this is good. This is good. And I came back, and I didn't want to go to sleep. And I, ca I came back to the editing room, and I stayed up all night editing this little piece. And um, the managers of, of the Mars, uh, Brian Muirhead, the, the manager of um, Mars Pathfinder, he really wanted to show it in the press conference. And uh, the media department was like, no, 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 we don't, we don't do that. We can't show anything emotional. And he said, no, nope, I'm showing it. And he did, and that kind of changed everything. People were really moved emotionally by that, seeing these engineers scared and crying and hugging. This was something that hadn't really been shown before for so long, really, since the you know, moon landing. So um, they said, okay, John, we, we kind of want some more of this. Uh, you know, keep it, tone it down a little. But and uh, so when it came time to finally do Seven Minutes of Terror, um, I was asked during a meeting, they said, hey, we needed, you know, Another one of those, uh, um, this is dangerous, uh, just need to show the public what it is and may be dramatic. And so I'm sitting there in the meeting going, oh man, I want it to be really scary. <laughs> and uh, so I started like playing the Inception trailer music in my head during the meeting and kind of, I'm like, I know what I want to do. So I ran out of that meeting and called up Adam Steltner, um, the lead engineer for the entry descent landing system I said, hey, can you do the, uh, can I interview you like tomorrow morning? So we did. And I brought my desk lamp from home and I just, you know, I said, okay, so we just pretend we're in a bar and uh, you're just going to lean forward in the table over a beer and you're going to say, John, uh, so uh, this is really what's going to happen. This, uh, this might not work. Um, I said, if you can, and so we kind of did that and he did it. Like the first thing out of his mouth is like, uh, when people look at it, it, it looks crazy. Uh, and sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. And like that was the opening of the video right there. I'm like, that's, that's what I want. That's it. And so I edited a rough demo like that night. Um, I used the Inception music uh, for it. And that's why some of people have said, hey, this music sounds like Inception. Because when I finished it, I had to kind of replicate that music because everyone liked it so much. But um, I did the rough demo. And uh, I was like, my manager's not going to like this. It's too, like, putting it all out there. This is crazy. And uh, so I kind of hit it. And I secretly kind of did it real quick and kind of showed it to some upper management people <laughs> first. So um, because they really wanted to show science in it. And I'm like, you can't say science in this video. No, you know. I really want to show vulnerability <laughs> um, because I feel like that is the key to uh, engaging people is to show, is to not be afraid to say, look, uh, I'm, I'm scared about this. It could fail. And um, I could fall flat on my face. Um, but I truly believe that in order to, if you want to, like great success comes with great failure. There, there's just no other way around it. You have to be prepared to fail. If you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. Like failing is a really good thing as long as you don't do it every time, but um, <laughs> you know don't make a habit of it. But uh, it's not bad. Um, so let's see. I think that's a good point, though. I, the the point of uh, and uh, we uh, have all belonged to various organizations, especially Mike and I, in terms of uh, X Prize and, and ISU here and Singularity, is. Uh, but also as entrepreneurs and as writers and artists, the, the point of failing and failing not only often, but fail fast. And uh, last night's panel, you guys talked a little bit about it. And the, the kind of the point of what does that mean, fail and fail fast? 
Um, if you fail, let's say, from the movie perspective or as a writer, as in you're writing something down and you're only at the paper stage um, and, and you fail by sharing it with others and you find flaws in it, that's a much easier thing to fix than if you go off and from the movie perspective or from a game perspective or a company is you keep everything internal and you're really careful and you can't, failure is not an option as you guys are talking about and you wait until the very end and it doesn't work. Now you've spent, you know, maybe you're making John Carter and you've spent $300 million and now you've failed. Now that, that, that had been, been tested on paper and shared, they would have immediately known what a stinker they had. Um, and, but this is a policy not only in what we do in art, but also on what we do in, in science. And I, I think it's this, what's great about this video that John did this is that it embodies the important thing in film, which is it's not about the technology. It's not about, even when we're doing a film that embodies science, uh, it's about that human element. So I mentioned uh, Interstellar, and I'm going to go down the panel of what's your favorite and, and least favorite science fiction movies from the perspective of, on your favorite, how it emotionally moved you. Uh, and from your least favorite, you can say anything you want. Um, and for me, uh, I think my favorite this year, and uh, I'll have probably Dan correct me, is Ex Machina. Is that how you pronounce it? Ex Machina. Yeah, so how many people have seen that? Mm -hmm. right, everyone should go see that film. And the reason you should is, is here's a film with a low budget that I think is one of the best science fictions because it, it really takes a principle about artificial intelligence and, and robotics and tells a, a realistic story, uh, which is really a mystery and a, you know, there might be kids in here so I won't say what I really want to say, a, <laughs> a, a mind uh, something. Uh, and it, <laughs> it, but it really grips you and, and, and moves you and makes you think. Now, I, I love these type of movies. I do think, though, that, that it, it's one of those things that happens in society. Film influences people. Mike and I spoke about this. Film changes your consciousness and, and creates attitudes. And there are attitudes and actual fears about AI because of all the movies that we've made. Uh, and yet, I've just mentioned the, my favorite movie, which will continue that fear. Um, but the things that Deep Blue and other machines are going to be doing for your lives in the next five to ten years, uh, the type of artificial intelligence that's evolving is really going to be freeing and empowering and has, there's nothing to fear from them. But um, I know Mike has some really strong <laughs> opinions about movies, so I let him talk about four or five of his least favorite. Um. <laughs> Once every seven, eight, ten years, the American Film Institute lists its hundred best movies based on the vote of their membership. And whatever they do, I list my hundred best just for myself. I don't think I've ever had a science fiction film in the top 95. Uh, if I were to pick the best of them just because it did the least damage, probably uh, Fantastic Voyage. But th think about some of the huge blockbusters. Think about Star Wars. Does it bother anybody besides me that they are trying to replace an emperor with a princess and this doesn't do much for the voter on the street? <laughs> or how about the, the recent billion dollar movie, Avatar? You learn in the first minute that we can go faster than the speed of light across the galaxy, but we no longer know how to make a self-propelled wheelchair. I mean, ev I just don't go to science fiction films anymore. <laughs> I, I yell at the screen. So, sue me. You're next. So, uh, I, I, I will, uh, since you're an, uh, a, a, an author, uh, what is your favorite hard science fiction? Uh, 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 outside of your own. I don't do hard science. Do, I don't even do weak science. I do limp science. Limp science. <laughs> uh, my favorite hard science? Science fiction. Either Clark's uh, City in the Stars or Hal Clement's uh, Mission of Gravity, I would think. And there was one, there were a couple you were mentioning that at lunch, uh, your, one of your favorite sci-fi uh, authors. You'll who, have to 
<laughs> who, but people don't people. really, you know, um, towards the, you, most people don't know this author's name. In fact, I, I hadn't heard his name before, but in terms of science fiction. I can't remember. Yeah, your well, well, we'll, we'll see if he remembers when he comes back. Your single yeah. favorite author. Your single favorite author. The Demolished Man. My single the Demolished favorite Man. author. Yeah. Uh, Demolished Man. Boy, that's, that's hard. The single favorite author. Maybe Alfred Bester. Is that the name you were yeah, looking for? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I hadn't, but I'm going to check no, it out. It, he, he only did two novels during most of his career, The Demolished Man and The Stars My Destination. They came out in the early 1950s, and what I was telling Harry is if you read them today, they read still like they're five years ahead of where the field is today. He, he was that innovative a writer. Dan, the the question is, the yeah, favorite? your favorite and least favorite science fiction movie. Since we're we're do, we're doing uh, space meets popular culture, but I'll I'll extend it to science fiction uh, okay. and science meets science meets popular culture. Those are hard questions. Uh, you know, I honestly, uh, as a filmmaker, I, I don't know that I like it all. <laughs> I I don't have one that I. You know, they, they all have their merits, and they all did pretty much their job, you know, in, in their time. And um, I mean, even like movies like Zardoz and stuff, the <laughs> fact that they exist is, is, is really cool. You know, I had, I had some that I like better than others, of course, but um, uh, AI. What yeah. makes a good sort of uh, science fiction movie for you? Well, you as know, as a filmmaker, it's really about escape you know I, I think it's really disappearing into ideas and concepts that somebody's sort of putting out there there's their premise and this is what they're trying to say and you know sometimes is it's coherent and sometimes it's that, not is that the movie with Tom Cruise Minority <laughs> Report no Minority Report <laughs> it, it came from a story called AI that's right. uh, yeah yeah I, I guess I was referring to the one with Haley Joel Osment Stephen that start was started by Stanley Kubrick but the movie that never ends. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I uh, actually use that one in my class when I'm teaching about writing. It's like, could you just put down the pen now? Because <laughs> <laughs> because we watch AI, it's like, and the movie's over. No, <laughs> it's not over. And the movie's over. No, it's not. The movie's over. Finally, you just get up and leave because it's got a half hour left. <laughs> so and part of that is is you should know when to end the movie, and that was probably you shouldn't have made the movie because the actual uh, architect of it had passed oh, away. I, I will compliment Arthur Clark on his half of the screenplay, uh, 2001. Uh, if you run it through your uh, video machine, you put a clock on it, you'll be amazed to find out that not a word is spoken in the first hour. This is called show, don't tell, and it's admirable. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's another movie that, how many people have seen the, uh, the black and white um, sort of set to music, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Really? Yeah. <laughs> Go online. It is absolutely brilliant. It turns out you can watch that entire movie uh, and you don't, does, does not need to, to have uh, dialogue in it at all. And the reason you do it in black and white, um, and it was actually done by a, by uh, a very famous uh, other filmmaker who decided to take it. Uh, but it, you're in for a treat. Um, and you realize as a filmmaker, and I'm going a little off scale, but it is science, is, is it's very intimidating because if you put that movie into grayscale, you realize it has the best lighting ever. And you decide that, okay, now I'm not sure if I want to go make another movie because <laughs> it's never going to stand up to this. But you should check out the black and white version of, of Raiders of Lost, Lost Ark. Um, Mike. So uh, I would never make any comments about science fiction films because whatever I say, these guys will uh, criticize me. But uh, I, I second. Actually, whatever you say, I'm going to criticize <laughs> you. So it's but, not limited to film. But I, uh, I will second uh, Harry's suggestion on absolutely you must see Ex Machina. I think it's uh, fantastic. The videography is uh, tremendous. Uh, it takes place in the in the near future, and uh, there's so many uh, questions about uh, you know the singularity, artificial intelligence, and uh, in fact. Uh, Mike has written some books about some similar themes. Uh, some. So, uh, what, do you want to tell him about uh, the book about the priest, uh, the robot in the Bible? Oh, that, that was a short story. Yeah, uh, but they'll, they'll be interesting. Uh, what was it called? Um, goodness gracious. I only wrote it about five years ago. It was a Hugo nominee. It was about a robot. It was a mechanical uh, 
gardener and caretaker at a, at a church and uh, was able to read. He picked up a Bible and decided he wanted to convert to Christianity. And you had the problem of the minister defending the fact that every word in the Bible is true, but the robots don't have souls. And that was the conflict. It's actually a great short story. Um, I, I forgot to mention that Mike uh, has had uh, 37 Hugo nominations. Um, most writers uh, strive their entire life to get a nomination. And Mike has five wins. He actually holds the uh, record uh, in terms of nominations and wins for a short story. Well, so. thank you. I'm too old to blush, but <laughs> I would otherwise. <laughs> and he's, he's nominated again uh, for this, this upcoming uh, um, Hugo Award. Uh, yeah. John? Um, well, l as far as like science fiction, my, my all-time favorite science fiction fan is definitely Blade Runner. Um, I <laughs> that the the loneliness aspect, this this person, you know, having there's there's one thing that I enjoy in all my favorite films. They all have this one thing in common. Did you ever see the movie The Game with yeah. Michael Douglas? There's this one moment in that movie that perfectly describes what I think is so important in every story, or that it should have. It's that moment when he's, he's sitting in, a, in his uh, bar, his club, his private club with these two other people, and his, and his quest in this movie is to figure out what the game is. And um, this guy leans over to him and he's like, do you wanna, do you wanna know what the game is? John chapter nine, verse 25. And he's like, uh, I haven't been to Sunday school in a while. And he's like, for once I was blind, now I can <gasps> see. And I was like, yeah that is like the core of like what every like hero has to go through. And that's what in Blade Runner, it's just like his eyes are open at the end to who he really is. Sorry, I'm not spoiling anything. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, I love that movie. I've seen it just like a hundred times and I'm always finding something else hidden in that movie somewhere. So good, now I, we, I can get a fight going on the panel because I think it's one of uh, Mike's least favorite movies. Really? Uh, not one of my least favorite. There are a lot dumber ones even than that. But uh, <laughs> since they know the, the robots, androids, call them what you will, are all going to kill over and die in a week, and that they are not here to kill everybody but just two or three people, why not just put a guard around those three people and not send all these guys out to die? <laughs> it's got a good point. <laughs> it's like, wait a second, we know they're going to die. Yeah, so we should just pick up those three guys and fly them to Saturn or something. I've never been able to figure out one science fiction film that didn't have a million holes. Uh, I, I gave you one, the, the movie uh, that just came out, The Ex Machina. Oh, yeah. I well, actually, 2001 didn't have a lot of gaping holes. But anyway, uh, I, I, I actually <laughs> like the movie, so uh, <laughs> but I, I thought you, you, you two guys could check it out. Um, we have mics, so uh, uh, I actually have two mics here, but you guys have mics as well. So. Um, why don't somebody who wants to ask a question uh, come up and get the mic, or we can get the mic to you. Hmm. Does anybody want to ask a question? Anyone? No question. No question. Can you stand in the middle? Oh, I thought I... No? Nope. You can just shout it to us. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for everything to this moment. Uh, I'd like some reaction from anyone, or, or several, to the idea that often in science fiction or science, uh, whatever, you know, however far, fantasy, whatever, there's a portrayal of the future. To what extent is there either, a, uh, do any of you feel there should be or is or should be an ethical responsibility to try to portray positive visions of the future? And how do you feel about the way the current you know, industry works in terms of presenting dy dystopia futures or positive visions of the future? How has this question of ethics come into it from your perspective? Or is it just simply entertainment? Um, so I have very strong opinions on that, so I, I all go last, and I, I hand it over to, uh, to the end of the panel, and we'll just go this way. 
Um, well, I always feel like science fiction, it, it kind of has a duty to, uh, to, to warn people <laughs> about, uh, Mike actually uh, said it earlier today, so I'm just, you, you said, he said in a meeting earlier, he said, uh, you know, sci it's not up to science fiction to pre predict the future, but to say what if. And, and I think uh, I just totally agree with that. So I pass it to you. Sure. So um, it's kind of interesting because a lot of a lot of people, a lot of critics of Hollywood, or a lot of critics of culture, or a lot of uh, critics of film, that argue that um, films kind of dumb down society. That films uh, are, uh, you know, they're they're you know unethical, or they're pornographic, or they they teach bad values. We should keep them away from our kids. Um, it, I, I have a very different view, and I think that um, I think that uh, as artists and engineers, uh, what we create becomes part of us. So I'm talking about humanity. So I mean, we created fire, and we created wheels, we created uh, habitats, and and those things that we design and those things that uh, that we build become part of us. And so, it, it, so I think that, and, and the reason why. You know, a lot of people say, why did you guys travel far distances to be part of this panel? And I think that this is one of the most important subjects in terms of promoting space. There's a, there's a, there's a crisis globally in terms of how do we move forward in space. And I think that uh, entertainment is an important aspect of how we try to get humanity back on track. And um, so I think that uh, it's much more powerful, and there's, there's certainly ethical questions about it, at the moment, I don't think I want to address the ethical questions. I just want the impact that films can make in order to continue to take humanity to the next level, uh, next evolutionary level of humanity. So I think it's incredibly powerful. Uh, there are tons of ethical issues involved with it. We could spend a lot of time. But for me personally, uh, I'm kind of uh, very uh, end related in terms of just trying to have an impact. Uh, well, for me, I think it's all fair game. Um, Harry wants to write a, you know, ap apocalyptic vision of you know, a utopian future, and maybe you want to do one that's a, a beautiful, a beautiful future. I think uh, ex exploit the genre, you know, and and the more we learn, and the more, the more we touch on, the more it can expand, and then we can build off of that. So, uh, you know, it really is, you know, look at it from all sides. To me, it's looking looking at it from all sides, but I do believe filmmakers have a responsibility to their audiences because, um, as you just said, it's it's really a powerful medium. And uh, I know this from some of the letters, you know, working at the Walt Disney Company, we get fan mail a lot, and uh, some of the, some of the letters that we get are are quite astonishing. It, it really affects people's lives, and um, so I, I think. You know that that's an enormous responsibility, and I think about that every time I, I do a movie. However, I think you know, as far as content, it should be all, all fair game. You know, go for it. Uh, whether it's it's literature or film or theater, I think every author has at most, by definition, one concept of utopia. He can't have two, or one of them isn't utopia. There's only one perfection. And since almost all drama depends on some form of conflict, you can solve it in an upbeat, utopian way once. Every other uh, approach you make is by some degree going to be dystopian or deal with problems that wouldn't exist in a perfect society. And that's what the question was. Why do we do it? Because you'd get awfully bored if we told the same utopian story 30, 40 times in a row. I actually agree with most of, of everything you guys have said. I think it's actually they're separate. I, I think dystopia and ethics and morality, they're, they're not connected in storytelling. I, uh, one of my favorite and probably everybody in this panel's favorite stories in terms of short stories would uh, be the lottery, okay? That's a pretty dystopic future, but it explores ethical issues like crazy. Um, as a writer in, in Star Trek Voyager and my friends who've worked on Star Trek is it became very boring uh, because they started to put these rules, like uh, crazy rules that, well, you know, you can't 
uh, the, the, the captain of the Enterprise Can't Bleed was, was one that Brandon Bragg was talking about, some dumb producer <coughs> told him. Um, and I often would pitch stories at Star Trek, and they would come back and go, well, you, we can't do this, we can't do that, because they're trying to, to keep the genes, uh, uh, you know, bright future. But that wasn't the way Gene <laughs> told stories. It was, yes, there is this positive future, but there's still a lot of bad things running around. And you can tell uh, ethical stories. There's, the panel may laugh at, at the next thing I say because it goes to something during dinner, but I'm famous in the Star Trek world because I murder children. Um, <laughs> I, I, in fact, killed two of them. I did one uh, with Robert Picardo where I gave him a real family and he faces the, we see for the first time, and this is like in what, the fourth Star Trek series, but we hadn't seen up till then uh, life in the 24th century. And ironically, we see life for the first time with a holographic artificial intelligence. Uh, and he starts off with a Leave it to Beaver family, and the story evolves where, you know, Bolana uh, Taurus comes in and she gives him a real family. And uh, we see life in all of its, its hecticness. And it, it tells some, uh, a very good sort of moral and ethical story. In fact, it, instead of having gain culture, it has Klingon uh, uh, culture, which is, which is even worse. They, they do ritualistic cutting, uh, but not of them themselves. Um, and so it, it, as a storyteller, I think once you try to put these, oh, well, let's put these boundaries so we're going to tell non-dystopic stories and positive things, you actually have a weaker story. It's much easier to tell strong ethical stories uh, where things are terrifying. So also, just listening to that, you had mutually contradictory uh, situations. They want a feel-good future in which everybody's happy, and the whole thing takes place aboard an armed military ship. Why? <laughs> well, what, what, one last thought, and then we'll go to this question over here. Um, so, you know, one of the powers right now, one of the most powerful elements in entertainment is Netflix. And one of the great things, depending on how you look at it, one of the great things that Netflix can do is they can pull a tremendous amount of information about the people who watch their movies. And Netflix can now go back to writers and say, hey, uh, many of our people like dark movies. Many of our people like movies that are based in Washington, D.C. Many of our people like movies that have conspiracies. Many of our people like movies that have a very unfortunate ending. So in the future, the question might be, you know, uh, can immoral audiences end up driving immoral uh, content? But at the, and I agree with everyone else. I don't have a problem with that, but I'm just saying it's very, it's very, very people powered at the, at the end of the day. So maybe, uh, yes, question. All right, first I'll see if I'm, is it working? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so I'm with the S SP15, uh, but I'm also a part of a science fiction writing club back home. And one of the big issues that we have in the, in the group is this kind of debate over whether or not the golden age of science fiction, so to speak, has passed. Uh, a lot of the people in the group think that um, kind of the golden age of hard kind of ideas driven science fiction is kind of over and that we've moved on to a more kind of mainstream, kind of more accessible science fiction. And I just was basically wanting to know what your guys' thoughts were on that kind of big debate. Um, well, I mean, I'll give you my opinion as a filmmaker uh, and in a consumer of, of hard science fiction is uh, I'd say no. I mean, I, I think that, in fact, uh, the number of ways that I can get hard science fiction from filmmaking, from uh, video games, from uh, the emergence of AR and VR, there's some very cool, I, I, think, I think you're going to see a new revolution, in fact, in terms of entertainment. Um, we, just as, as 3D came finally into its own, um, in terms of going to the movie theaters and, and getting really good 3D, and it, we moved past the, the, the red and, and blue glasses, uh, AR and VR is about to explode. Um, I just came back from uh, E3, where there's no less than 18 different VR systems. And it's not just seeing something and being able to track your head, and having a faster frame rate. Uh, they're now equipping AR and VR, VR particularly, so you can do everything. There are devices where literally you would stand up in a harness and you can run, and as you run, your, your character is moving around. And there are other AR and VR where you can grab onto 
is something called Sense, where you can grab onto these, these remotes. And you could do this AOR um, Star Wars combat. This sort of stuff, I think, is going to have a much bigger impact as I can put you in to uh, fantasy worlds, but I can also put you into um, the space station. I can put you on Mars. Uh, we, we started to explore how does this affect culture as you get to be in the first person of, of a thing. Um, and you can start imagining, for instance, I was predicting that maybe our first, uh, you know, you'll, you'll have a, a Mars landing of, of a probe, but it will be group controlled by millions of people who are observing it through VR. And depending upon where the group is looking, that's where you're going to go. Um, so you'll use a human group mind. Um, but so I think hard science fiction uh, will experience another golden age because you're going to have everything from Magic Leap. You know, you have $550 million going into augmented reality to one company. These things are going to be uh, in the next 10 years. And in fact, by in the next 18 months, you're going to see a lot of uh, VR product out. So. Go ahead. Uh, I'll make it very quick and brief. Uh, I may write about the future. I refuse to live in the future. <laughs> Your turn. <Yeah. laughs> well, that, that, that was brief. Um, <laughs> I think like, like anything about a golden age, um, for me the golden age is when I first discovered the little pulp books that I could afford to pay for when I was 10 years old and, and, and reading those and, and, and it, it was like a world opening up to me and so I started tracking that from when I was young and, and then I stopped being that interested in it and, uh, and I think like with music and fashion and everything, there are these cycles that happen. Um, I watched it happen in, you know, with the audience's uh, taste in motion pictures, uh, especially from film, you know, family entertainment, that it goes up and then it goes down. And, it, and wh what was popular, you know, a few years ago is now like, we don't care so much about it. So chances are it'll probably rise again and become, you know, be become golden again if, if, if it's not. All right, so we're about uh, getting close to, to wrap up. Um, uh, Mike? Uh, I'll, I'll, pa I'll pa pass it. I'll pass it to them for closing remarks. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I can. I think that the golden age is not over. It's hard to compete with so much that has come out, uh, especially just, I mean, how many new ideas can you come up with? But I think good science fiction tells us who we are and where we're going, and honestly, we still don't know. And we might not be able to come up with all the same things that, that all these movies did, but uh, there's so many unanswered questions and things that we skipped over in our rush to get to the future. I mean, one of the problems is we live in the future now. Like, all the things that were talked about, that, that Arthur C. Clarke talked about in the past and wrote about, here we are, we're in the future, so now what are we going to write about? But we've passed over a lot of great things that are now making us feel empty and alone, and that's what science fiction loves to talk about is like the human condition. So it's, there's plenty of golden opportunities for us left. So. And I think I'll, I will make a closing remark, which is that uh, I think that um, not everybody in, this, in the audience will become filmmakers, not everyone will become uh, uh, documentary filmmakers, but I think that uh, if you want to have an impact in space, you have to be a communicator. And I think that uh, a lot of the skill set that's required for uh, for filmmaking, for uh, you know, visual impact, are the same sort of skills that you can use uh, to persuade a manager that uh, you need a project to become uh, uh, supported or to be uh, funded, or to uh, an, to a venture capitalist who you say, "I have a great idea, but I need to, you know, I'm going to communicate to you something that doesn't exist, but I'm going to deliver that." So I think uh, these skill sets are are very, very important, and I think that. Uh, you know, many people right now are very pessimistic about the current structure of, uh, you know, space agency, government space. But I think through communication, I remain optimistic. And I think that these are very powerful tools that are at your fingertips. And so I encourage you to continue with your interest in this area. Dan? Oh, I think that was a terrific closing remark. And I can't close on a closing remark like that. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 
I'll just say thank you all for your attention. Oh, my thing just went through. Um, um, for for uh, listening to us, and uh, thanks to, to Alex e for inviting me here to to participate. You know, it's been really a, it's been really stimulating for me, and uh, you know, it's it's exciting to think that you know everybody here can has the potential to move their ideas forward, and we move forward. Let's see where it goes. Mike. Um. Arthur C. Clarke wrote hard science fiction, which is the absolute antithesis of what, for example, Ray Bradbury writes or wrote until this year. And as long as they do it well, and both of them did, there's room for, for all kinds of fiction in the field, just as there's room for all kinds of movies as long <coughs> as they're good. Um, beyond that, I thank you very much for inviting me. I've enjoyed it. So. I have a couple of closing remarks, the, and I'll start uh, with the the first one, which is after this panel is all done, before you pour out, I like to take a selfie when I give a talk. So if when we're all done, like as many people to come up here, and we're going to do a, a group selfie for the talk. Uh, <laughs> that's the most important thing. <laughs> the the other part is is, is I want to add to what what Mike had to say, and actually tell you a little exercise that I think you can do. So I, you know, I, I am a scientist who also, I have uh, three or four companies going on right now, depending upon how you count them. Um, and a big part of getting not only funding, but knowing where you're going and getting alignment for you and your team, whether you're working on a group project or you want to start the next uh, Facebook or, or billion dollar uh, you know, VR company, is to be able to know what your story is. And as a simple exercise, start by writing a one-page story from the perspective of your company now that it's successful, and also from the perspective of your customer and the perspective of your chief scientist and the perspective of how the public sees you. If you go through that exercise, you will have to rethink uh, and think deeply about what you're doing, which is really what science fiction and storytelling is about. It's that what if, but in this case, you can apply that what if to anything that you're doing. Any sort of company, any sort of project you're working on, you can apply that same storytelling tool. And uh, I think you will find that to be a very powerful way to get ahead. So with that, I wanted you to thank the uh, panelists for uh, coming. Thank you. thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. We, uh, we have a little gift for each of you. Uh, as we heard uh, Joe Pelton talk about uh, at the beginning, um, Sir Arthur had many ideas of, of very futuristic things, I'm sure. Somewhere in his notes, he, uh, he wrote something about laser etched crystals with the ISU logo in them. <laughs> 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 and so, uh, so we have one of those for each of you. Th and thanks again for, uh, um, for uh, being our panel tonight. Now we expect that, that some you. of you are interested in meeting our panelists, so we'd like to invite all of you to, you. after our selfie, uh, to uh, <laughs> join us all for reception just outside the doors here. And, um, and again, we'd like to thank Music you all for coming and uh, wish you a, a good night and, uh, and a, a great positive future. <laughs> thank you all. Can we have the house lights up so I can get my selfie in here? Come on, guys. Yeah, they're up. You guys just get behind me. Can we get these lights off? Shut these ones off. Down, down, down. All right. Mike is, Mike's big, so I'm going to have to do it this way as best as possible. Come on, Mike. You good?